Um, some familiar names. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen with you guys. Um, mm -mm. There we go. And now up after keynote. So this uh, next 45 minutes is going to be about everybody wins, but who's paying? Um, I was thinking I would need like 30 minutes to say what I what I want to tell you guys. And then after that, um, I'd be happy to take some questions or to hear your ideas and discuss. Uh, but in case you do have uh, like a pressing question that cannot wait, feel free to interrupt. Uh, at this point, I'm sharing my screen. I cannot see you guys anymore. So uh, feel free to just interrupt with audio because I can also, I, I cannot read the chat. So if you put something there, I won't read it <laughs> till the end. Um, let me turn on clock as well. So I won't lose track of time. Um, yeah, there we go. So um, you can all hear me OK, right? Yes. OK, perfect. Uh, so my name is Emma. Uh, I'm uh, currently in Paris, but I live in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm 21. And I know open knowledge in Belgium uh, mainly through education. Um, and uh, that is because four years ago, I graduated from high school. And I decided not to enroll in a university, but instead to design my own college education. Um, so that's a whole different story <laughs> and a whole different talk. But uh, I just wanted to let you know, because that was really the entrance for me to become interested in open source and working open in general, uh, because I created MS College. So MS College is uh, it says it there very clearly. It's a personal university designed, managed, and attended by me. Um, I uh, decided to that I wanted to learn in the real world. I researched learning and education, and I began giving lectures in that and consulting companies and and schools on their learning strategy. So what started out as something that I wanted to learn for myself and delving in those theories and then using myself as a guinea pig also started to become um, the way for me to earn money. So it was kind of like a two way street of uh, being an entrepreneur and guiding my own learning. And that is what is MS College. So if you go to mscollege.com, you find this uh, notion page that has really, really is documentation of what I've done the past years. And I created that about a year ago, or I started creating it then, because I was, I think, about two years into this journey, when I figured that uh, it might be important to, for me to document what I was learning and what I was doing, because I had a pretty, um, it wasn't like I was just doing or bringing into practice, ex executing this master plan uh, because I don't think learning works that way. It's way more organic than that. But I was very precise on which mentors I had, which pairs I had, how I uh, made sure I had the right balance between online and offline learning and um, practical and theoretical learning. Uh, so I wanted to share that because I figured I'm not going to get a degree. And my friends that were in university were like, approaching their final years and writing theses. Um, so I decided to uh, delve into the world of how to create a portfolio and also open badges. And that's how I came across open recognition. And open recognition is something that open knowledge uh, also works a lot on. And it's the idea that uh, if we create openness in the skills and knowledge that people have, learning becomes easier and everybody wins. Because imagine, I think it's like 15 of us right now in this group, imagine that we have clear insight into the skills and knowledge of everybody involved here. It would become so much more easier to, so much more 
easy to learn from each other and with each other. And there are quite some uh, uh, initiatives already focusing on, hey, as, as the nature of work is changing and as the nature of learning is changing, we should go differently about um, how we, how we uh, make learning visible and how we credit learning. Uh, for example, through open badges, but in uh, in open knowledge, I really found the first partner uh, who who spoke about learning and who spoke about recognition in the same way as I thought of it. And that is not something that has to do with evidence and proving uh, and status within society, but rather as uh, making a, a continuous process visible and in doing so enhancing that that precise process of learning because it becomes more effective or you can more effectively find others to learn from and to learn with if you have that open recognition. So open recognition was really um, the first contact point I had with working open and with the philosophy of open knowledge and uh, in Belgium and uh, and that made me question what does open source mean really um, throughout the past three years I, I'd been involved with uh, the development of uh, multiple uh, software products and apps uh, that had to do with making informal learning easier and um, making uh, making it easier for people to learn in groups and most of those initiatives were open source but what I saw happening is that open source was really reduced to uh, putting your code on github and telling people that uh, yes it is there you can, you can look it up but I can't code myself I was interested in the the possible solutions those those ideas or those products could offer but there were no way accessible and um yeah to an extent i was kind of um disappointed in what open source was at that point or the the first uh interactions i had with uh how the philosophy was brought into life um until i i found out that years and years like 20 maybe 30 years ago when mozilla started publishing about what open source should be uh they really define it as open source should be uh working transparent and participatory and for me the the element of participatory is exactly what i missed um as i'm not a coder myself but i am an interested and i know like enough of the basics to be able to have a constructive conversation with somebody who, who does know how to how to build these things. Um, so I became interested in um, in how can we use open source in a way that it was intended. And for me that is uh, going beyond putting your code on GitHub and making that transparent. It goes beyond giving solely a technical explanation. It's really, um, I don't know if you guys, there are some Dutch speakers in the audience. I don't know if you guys know the correspondent. Um, this is where if anybody knows it, you should offer yourself, <laughs> you should speak up. Yes, I know it. Yeah, you know it. So what the correspondent does, they're a news platform and they are, uh, their like slogan is an antidote against breaking news. So they have this whole philosophy, which is very interesting and you should definitely check out. They have this whole philosophy about how news should be about things that are important, not things that sell and things that click. So it shouldn't be breaking, it should be constructive. So they're way more on, if you have a spectrum of like uh, the the one hour news cycle and then uh, investigative journalism, they are way more to the right of that spectrum or to the left for you guys. Um, but what they do, what, what for me is a very interesting 
uh, example of working open or working open source is that they give insight into their process as journalists and their research process, but they write it in such a way that anybody who is not a, a journalist can also understand. And for me, that is the level of participatory um, software development or participatory solution development of, of any kind uh, should be. So with that in mind, and given that I kind of had seen the world of, of designing your own education or I wanted something new, I, uh, I created or founded the Open Fields Foundation this, at the beginning of this year. And here I just copy our, our mission statement. Uh, the Open Fields Foundation works on open, entrepreneurial, and quick-witted solutions for complex problems. Our work arches over the borders between countries, domains, and clusters in society in uniting the power of tech and the power of inspired citizenship. We aim to advance equality. It's a very fancy text, basically saying that I and we, my board and I, we think that uh, open is a good idea and that open in the definition of being transparent and participatory is a good idea to kind of remember within software development as well as um, reintroduce or further introduce into other domains of society, mainly in how research is being done academically, for example. So when um, the, when Open Knowledge Belgium asked me to, if I wanted to say something or give a talk during um, during Open Belgium. I first thought, well, what do I have to say? They're, <laughs> they're way more experienced in anything open. And uh, with regards to this whole field, I, I, I really feel like a new kid on the block, uh, which I like, but also, might not give me the full credibility to uh, to talk like too, with too much confidence about it. Um, but what I did think would, might be interesting is to talk about the uh, financial structure uh, behind doing um, work that involves advancing openness in society. Because as I started the Open Fields Foundation, I um, I really thought a lot about uh, how can I make this a healthy organization financially and how how best to, to go about um, in general um, how, how to best go about projects that involve openness and projects that um, in which everybody wins but it's unclear who's going to pay for that um because it's it, it often is hard to quantify the or at least i find it hard to quantify if any of you totally disagree with that i'd love to hear your thoughts later but i up until now i find it hard to quantify the benefits of openness because so much of it is is dependent on a philosophy or a worldview and the hardest thing is to quantify the the benefits or the economic benefits benefits in general of working open before you start a project so there's if it's already there it's obvious but then it's already um from everybody or like of everybody so there's a very interesting uh really problem of the commons when it comes to um making things open because there is a reason things are the way they are and let me check the time yeah we're going good and that involves conflicting, conflicting interests. Uh, there are people, if, for example, it, let's take the example of um, a governmental institution that is not enclosing certain information that would be um, right for citizens to know. Um, there is conflict, conflicting interest because um, it might not be in the interest of the people working on that information to share everything because the transparency can be also it can lay bare their faults or their mistakes or their maybe lack of efficiency and that might not be in their interest because of course they want to keep their job uh there's power 
there's money and there's fear and these are all broad concepts but um there's habit i'm not sure if any of you guys kind of follow what happened with uh, a scandal in the netherlands revolving uh fraud with allowances so um is there anybody that knows that toeslagen affaire yes yes I, it, it was in the news in belgium as well ah okay yeah so basically what happened is that uh, dutch citizens have been treated horribly by our tax agency um there was racial profiling but also a uh, very harsh punishing of kind of minor mistakes uh which drove people into uh thousands and thousands of years of debts of losing their houses and really not um their cases were um not handled well by uh, judges as well as the tax agency um there were just people that were kind of um stuck in this uh cascaesque um is that an english word as well um this dystopian world where they were kind of held captive by a government that they wouldn't have access to this one person that would just help them um i think the easy solution there is well the everything that a tax agency does or their procedures should just be open and um that is of course easy to say but there are a lot of reasons also uh why people working there for example do not feel uh equipped or uh able to stand up for what is right um anyway that is um a, a long way to explain that there's also a reason why things are not open and that makes that not only it's unclear uh who's going to pay but it's also unclear if there is even somebody willing to pay because it there's this contraintuitive uh dynamic between open source being um or or working open being uh productive and better for society when it's there but the process of getting there is this is long and hard and nobody wants that when i started the open fields foundation i uh, that was at a point where i decided that for the coming years in my career i didn't want to maximize for profit but for independence and i talk I, I thought about that for a long time because um there there are for-profit companies and what they are optimized for is very clear they're optimized for profit uh, but then you have non-profit organizations and my question for a long time really was uh, I don't want to have an organization that is defined by what what is not optimizing because then what are you going to do <laughs> are you then optimizing for for every everything else and also it's it's just not clear where you're going so I don't know if this is just my brain but a, a non-profit is just a very unclear concept for me um so then I thought, well, is it for for um, for impact? But that can be true for companies as well. Or is it for social justice? But that can be true for companies as well. And if the sole purpose of an organization, in essence, is to um, continue to exist, then I think what, in my definition, the the goal for uh, a non-profit should be optimization for independence so that you can continue to exist doing what you find important whether that is having impact or or solving whatever problem you're aimed at uh, but do that independently so you cannot be corrupt corrupted by or corrupted by money issues or time constraints or organizations that really stop you from from doing your work because you are dependent of them well, dependence, that is the interesting word, of course, here. Um, the big challenge around money is that you become dependent. And whether that is from clients or from uh, subsidies or from uh, private investors, as soon as you need their money, you need them and you are dependent. And that is exactly that is 
exactly opposite of that ind independence that I that I want for the Open Fields Foundation. So I I thought about this and I think that all uh, money relationships with stakeholders you can see in um like somewhere mapped on this graph. So one X is time and the other is power. So you can be time dependent, time independent, power dependent or power independent. And with time, I I mostly mean cash flow, really. Maybe I should change it into cash flow because if you're dependent on money because you need to deliver certain results at a certain time and your development of the solution that you're trying to create is constrained by the time restraints because you need money um th then you're time dependent and if there are no such constraints you're time independent and when it comes to power if people investing money or paying money to your organization means that they have decision-making power or they can influence the things that you're doing um in a in a profound way of course no organization is an, is an island and it is of course you're going to be influenced by your context and your stakeholders but i think there is um uh also a, a spectrum of how much the the money inflow influences uh the decisions that you make as an organization so for example government subsidies they could be time dependent because you have you are really restricted to their time frame on which date they're going to give you money and which you have to deliver like what things you have to deliver at a certain point uh and you could be power dependent because um if they're the only one funding a project if they don't agree with something that you're doing that makes you lose your funding and and uh makes you unable to for example pay your employees then of course you're dependent but there are also scenarios imaginable where you're you are time dependent but not so much power uh dependent more so power independent because the way the cont contract is structured uh they have no um no influence to the decision making process well what i've defined for myself are um and for, for the open fields foundation is this philosophy of three pillars that I try to uh, stick to in every money related um, decision that I make. First being all stakeholders are investors, some with money, others in value. Of course, I find it naive to think that you don't need money as an organization because you do. Um, you do need money in order to continue to exist because we live in a world where a lot of things cost money but money is not only is not the only value that your stakeholders can give you they could also give you social value they could give you recognition they could give you um access to their social capital their intellectual capital uh, they could give you information and feedback and those are all valuable they could give you access to their stuff or to their building. And those are all um, important ways to define value as well. So for me, this is a way to not get like a, a tunnel vision on, t on solely people that you have a money relationship with, because there are a lot of different value relationships you can have with stakeholders or people that are affected by the work that you do or that you're trying to do. Then access over resources. In a world where um, resources are abundant, I truly believe that. I think that access truly is the 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 gold, and and maybe money is the silver. And in all cases where I can choose between access over resources, I will always choose access to to people, to networks, to information, to data, rather than resources, because I think that the access is where the Scarcity lies and the resources uh, is where the abundance is. And then lastly, money should increase and not decrease freedom. This is as soon as I step or I'm, I'm about to step into a relationship with a stakeholder, a uh, money relationship with stakeholder where 
honestly, the, the freedom of, of the work I'm doing is decreased rather than increased. I take a step back and, and decline. And that is very, uh, contra it can be very contraintuitive because um, I think a lot of things in our society are, revolve around, we need money to be free. So it's, um, so we find it sensible to uh, kind of, let our freedom be degree decreased so we can be free. So we offer freedom to be free, if that makes sense. I think that's the wrong way around. So I try to keep this as a slogan um, in my mind. Um, my phone keeps screen locking, so I'm not sure where the time is. That's why I keep looking there. Um, so uh, this is all like uh, a, a nice story how would that work so we've only just started like two and a half months ago um so it might be weird for me to talk about this uh but i threw the thought that it, it might be interesting to share my ideas and to hear you guys's um especially as we are a young organization and i've i spent a lot of time lately thinking about this uh ideas for the future would be to distribute investors uh, so to make sure that you're not uh, dependent on just a few investors, but to consciously choose to, for example, not accept bigger grants, but go for a few smaller, um, which can cause a lot of extra work. But I think that it pays off in the freedom that you get from that. Um, then um, a personal payments. So this is the idea of buy one give one so uh, a lot of social entrepreneurs have incorporated that within their business model and i think that nonprofits can learn from that uh, so how can we create solutions in which people would not only be tempted to pay for themselves but also for others and it could be like a pay get one give one but it could also be buy something for somebody else so i would be interested in experimenting with that then consistent crowdfunding, not only for project, but uh, for example, in the forms of loans. There's a company in the Netherlands called Lend a Hand, who's a very, they're a very good example of crowdfunding with loans. Um, and there you can loan money to an African farmer for a few years, and they give uh, market average interest rates on all your loans. And that for me is a very great example of how crowdfunding can also be something more long-term rather than uh, your stereotypical or your <laughs> average Indiegogo project that is just, or GoFundMe, that is just about one project and one raising and, and a very like urgent campaign that revolves around that. Um, I just wanted to add, when it comes to distribution of investors, I think that is going to be even more important as there is this financial crisis that is going to come. I I think we, we haven't seen the worst yet at all when it comes to the economic impacts of COVID as well. So I'm curious to see how that's going to develop the whole landscape of subsidies as, um, yeah, it's gonna to be tougher weather for a lot of governments, I figure. Not that I'm such an expert on that, but that's just a thought. Uh, and then lastly, what I'm very interested in is the FIRE movement, but then for organizations. I'm not sure if there are many examples of this. I haven't seen it. So if anybody in the crowd uh, knows something like this, I, I'd love to learn, learn from that. The FIRE movement, it stands for Financial Independent Retire Early. So there's this whole niche or like subculture of people that have defined uh, being financially independent as a goal from the, for themselves and they have uh, investment strategies but also spending and income strategies that that make sure that they reach the financial independence as early as they can so the idea is that you build this um uh, the amount of money that you need to keep in the bank and to invest and with the average yearly interest rates, you will have your own basic income. So you can take out, um, let's say a thousand a month. And because the total amount of money is so big, it just keeps on growing uh, without you having to do anything. Um, that is of course also not something that's 
accessible for everybody. But I would be interested in exploring the possibilities for that as an organization to create total independence because you just have that much money uh, to invest and to get like an end of stream that just keeps growing. Well, then bringing this into practice, uh, this summer I'm hosting the Open Summer of Code in the Netherlands, which is a project that has uh, done fantastically over the past nine years already in uh, in Belgium, organized by Open Knowledge in Belgium. Uh, so I'm sure that a lot of people in the crowd know more about it, or maybe even have seen more about it than than I have the past year or yeah year and a half. Um, so what we're going to do is to take uh, societal problems uh, and to have students. Uh, create solutions for that open source for the month of July and in OSOC NL projects always entail a societal problem in dire need of fixing the open source technology you need to fix that participants that dare to share and a commitment to wait, make the world a better place so open summer of code is really like an accelerator for projects like these and what I would like to do is to take every project and, and uh, fund it in a different way to make sure that I and we as the Open Fields Foundation uh, can experiment with different ways of investing. And um, I'd be happy to share our experiences with that uh, because um, when I started looking into what does it mean to run a nonprofit, I was kind of disappointed by the uh, the, the tiny amount of uh, honest reflections on that or like lessons learned or best practices. Um, maybe there are resources that I've, I've totally missed, but when it comes to uh, running a, a for-profit company, there are so many resources on how to, how to best do that. Um, and I don't think there are that many for, for a nonprofit organization. Maybe because the landscape is so scattered because of your nonprofit, then and what are you? Um, but anyways, I, I'd be happy to share our experiences there as well. So this was mostly just ideas uh, that we'll be bringing into practice for the coming months. And I'd be happy to share our experiences. Um, and for now, I think it's like 4.30, uh, 3.30, I mean. Um, so I'll stop sharing and I'll be happy to take any questions if there are any questions. There's something in the chat. Yes. Oh, that was way earlier. That was maybe about what I, if I was, uh, if you could hear me okay. Are there any questions? No questions at all. Is there anybody who wants to share their experience? Maybe Astrid, do you want to share something about how um how you guys are doing this at a how you go about the financial health of open knowledge? Not to <laughs> not to <laughs> a good not question. To Good question. I should think about that before I uh, before I answer. <laughs> I'm also happy to hear from other from other people in the audience first. And people can use their uh, audio if they want. You don't have to type your question in the chat. Uh, hello. Can can you hear me? Yes, I yeah. think so. Uh, hello, uh, Emma, uh, Peter Jan. Um, I recently uh, also founded uh, a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. uh, so the questions you presented are, are the, one, the ones we've also faced regarding to uh, acquiring uh, the needed resources to, mm -hmm. to make things and to build things and to um, just to, to 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 free some time. In fact, for us, our reflection was that um, acquiring money would just allow us to buy ourselves time to invest in our foundation in our uh, mission 
uh, because most of us uh, do already have uh, jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, our non-profit non -profit, non -profit is like a side uh, occupation for most of us. Mm -hmm. um, so we, 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 we didn't have that, that many reflections on how to acquire the money because we could just uh, use our own existing resources to, to go yeah. forward. So, um, so it still was interesting to, to hear about uh, your reflections and your, how you um, differentiated um, the money income on being the, the independence you could, buy, you could have with it and not being yeah. constrained in time and money. It's uh, very, very interesting to know. I didn't really have uh, a particular question uh, because uh, I also am very, we are very uh, soon uh, and, um, uh, in a very young um, uh, organization. So we, we're not really yeah. facing needs of money right now because our own, if only to buy ourselves some time. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to, to, to congratulate, congratulate you in fact for your, for your, um, Investments and uh, and wishing you good luck on your on your, on, the, on your pursuits. That's great. So. Thank you. Yeah, I You're think welcome. that's a that's a the strategy um, that's very common and that that I'm uh, mostly doing myself now as well. So um, the financial independence. Um, what I, I see, see happening a lot is that the organization, a non-profit organization itself is not necessarily uh, completely financially independent or sufficient and, and healthy. And therefore, all the people involved uh, do unpaid work or uh, do like have a job and then do this as something second tier, which there is nothing wrong with that. And that can be a very, uh, yeah, very productive way to advance the, the uh, the cases or the issues that you find important but what I really find like it would make me so happy if I managed to create something that in itself is um, uh, is healthy and that the independence lies on the organization rather than the people like rather than it coming back to the shoulders of the people that are involved but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's so it's not a burden to carry on. It, you can carry on uh, on your own and not be uh, have to sell your values or or um, just uh, at attack the have be fragile in that aspect on, uh, yeah. on the independence. You, you yeah. Can exactly. exactly. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Mm, your pleasure. Anybody else? Well, if there's nobody, um, oh, there's nobody. Um, also, what should we do? Do you want to uh, say something about the uh, how open knowledge, or maybe? Well, you I saw that Bert is also in the in the call as our financial <laughs> responsible from the board. Maybe he wants to comment as well. Yeah, I, I was I was listening in and also uh, working at the same time. So uh, uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Emma. So yeah, for uh, I don't know if it's the open knowledge view or the uh, or my view, my personal view. But what I'm mainly interested also in is how uh, because a lot of the dependency of open knowledge is also on public money and on subsidies, which is uh, not always. Uh, as sustainable as it could be on the long term, because mm -hmm. each time you need to uh, reapply for subsidies, and it is uh, it's not a, a secure long term sustainable uh, income source, mm -hmm. uh, and, and rightfully so. So it's good that there are good uh, processes to to decide on where subsidies goes. But what I'm wondering is if if you are in a space of open source and yeah. there is some public interest if there is not another model possible in which public money gets allocated to public interest uh, things in a, in a way which is more uh, flexible than current uh, subsidies programs because like you like your title of your talk also say if everybody wins if society wins and everybody's paying uh, there's the subsidy yeah. it's all our money then uh yeah, this is this is uh, then this is another kind of uh, subsidy than uh, something which is 
uh, less reusable. So mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just wondering what 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 yeah. what's your uh, what's possible so, in that uh, field. Yeah. yeah, what I find interesting, and I'll put a book in the chat. It's called a new social contract, a new social contract, by a, a Dutch politician that played a, a major role in um, kind of um, uh, enclosing everything that happened with the allowance affair. Um, so he did a lot of research, and one of his uh, analyses about how this could ever happen is really um, one of the things that he highlights is that the um, and I haven't checked the data, so I might, <laughs> this might not be the most intelligent quote I've done this session, but um, he, he states that there has been this erosion in organizations that uh, are non-profit and that exist to kind of control the power of government uh, as well as support government. Um, so, so he states that, yes, we have this system of, um, uh, of paying taxes and being in a democracy and choosing your government but that system is uh it's not perfect so there will always be be flaws and citizens active citizens have to take up that um uh take up the space like the where the the erosion exists and control government for example or to show government how you can work openly um and uh, I'm saying all this because, yes, um, uh, governmental subsidies are a great way to fund things that are for everybody, but at the same time, sometimes what's good for everybody is to control the mere institution that su should distribute that wealth. And if you create a relationship of independent or, or of dependence with them, um, uh, you might uh, lose some of the the freedom to to work. So that's um, I'm not sure. Frank says something. This system exists. They're called funds. Would it give money to a fund? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, it is nothing new. <laughs> I know that uh, funds uh, do exist. What I find interesting, however, is how you as a nonprofit can create a balance of governmental subsidies as well as funds, because um, funds can be um, uh, can give you freedom in the sense that they are not governmental, but at the same time, they can also like restrict or uh, 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 take up decision making power that you don't want to give away. So. Um, I think the the interesting discussion is not necessarily which one uh, you should go all in on, but uh, which like you could combine to create. Who's then to say taking decision? Yeah, that is the the board of the um, of the organization that you've started. This is a funny conversation now with you typing. A fund also has a board. Yes, that is true. But if you see organizations as collectives of citizens that try to uh, support or control what the government is already doing, if that is like a rough definition I can just pose, um, then I think uh, none of those uh, collectives of citizens are going to be perfect. Um, so, so I think that the power really lies in the multitude of them. Because of course the the board and and how I lead my organization is not perfect. The same goes for for open knowledge. If I may, uh, maybe it's free to say that. I, can I can I add something to this? What what uh, yeah, uh, sure. Hans is also saying. Yeah. My, my point of view on this is so I totally agree with uh, what you're saying, Frans. The the my point of view is maybe from the government perspective. How do you avoid that? if you fund anything that uh, some of these funds goes to things that are not in the public interest so actually mm -hmm. the other the other way around how do you avoid that a subsidy is uh, used on things which is is not in the in the general public interest 
I think that's that's more the 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 point I, I, coming from my perspective, and this is mainly in uh, funding of uh, technology projects by government. Mm -hmm. I think I think they can it, it can be improved on how much of this work becomes public domain. Uh, uh, so the, the, the whole idea of being default in the public domain and then only the things that is really necessary out of the public domain. And I think that's uh, that's the uh, mm -hmm. the point of view. And I, I shared also a link. What I what I is an, what I think is an interesting idea of was an interesting idea. I don't know the status of that, but in the U.S., the 18F micro purchases platform, in mm -hmm. which. Uh, Actually, so that this is a, this is an, another way of uh, uh, trying to be as flexible as possible to solve a problem from the government with money from the government and anybody who can uh, uh, contribute uh, mm. has a possibility to contribute to it. So it's a, it's, it's not like a procurement process and it's not a subsidy; it's something in between. And I think yeah. this is a very nice. It could be a very nice model for specific use cases. Yeah. It also Thanks. it also exists in Belgium. Eh? Uh, there is nothing new. And uh, first of all, in the United States, you don't have to pay that much taxes. So if everybody is paying taxes to a democratic, a democratical um, uh, government who is spending then the money in subsidies, I, it's uh, I am a board member of many. Uh, not for profit organizations, and uh, you have small incremental subsidies. They are called tenders in Belgium. Eh? So you can win tenders, which are small and incremental, mm -hmm. but they give, give no continuity to the objective you want to realize in uh, some of those not for profit organizations. Eh? The objectives mm -hmm. are not always short term objectives they are always long term object yeah, exactly. uh, objectives eh? so you need long term money you need a lot of money and if you want to be independent eh, to realize mm -hmm. some things then then you have to have a mixture mixture of many yeah. different sources of finance and then it's only possible to be some kind of independent yeah but yeah. in a way you're yeah. always dependent eh? yeah yeah, so I all think those I forms think. exist. Eh? You, the, yeah. the Sorry, Fra Franz. Is, is, there, is there something missing that you that you think, or do you say okay, uh, there is enough available? No, no, no. There is a lot of things missing, and that's why I was here today. Yeah? But uh, uh, but uh, what, the what things is missing? that we are talking about, they all exist mm -hmm. in some way or another. So mm -hmm. um, if you really want to find something new, one of the new things that have been um, put forward in the last 10 years, but they all, all exist for many years before too, is, is a structured way of doing crowdfunding or something like that, in which you get money directly from people who are uh, yeah. interested in your objectives. Eh? That's, that's yeah, the that's way the, to do it. Yeah, that's the loans and, I talked about. Yeah, and that's, yeah, but loans are very, uh, uh, there are, there is a lot of scientific study on the small micro loans in uh, mm -hmm. the third world, how uh, destructive that they are. Eh? So mm -hmm. this, yeah. it is not a good example. But um, the uh, I think, for instance, Médecins Sans Frontières, eh, this Arte Zonder Grenze, is a good example of an organization that is active on a worldwide level mm -hmm. and which has a lot of independence because it only gets money from gifts yeah yeah and and then you get a powerful organization mm -hmm. with a board of course many boards and a yeah. whole kind of uh, structure but they will never take any money from any government because mm -hmm. then they lose independence eh? but mm -hmm. this is a good example of an organization which started very small is now very big and is having a lot of power also but has a lot of independence too. Eh? Um, yeah. yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I see uh, Peter Jan also in the chat. Kiss Kiss Bank Bank allows for free donation crowdsourcing. Yeah. Um, I am thinking, Astrid, I'm, I'm looking at the time. Yeah. Should we round up? 
Uh, yes, yes, we can. I will. I will already stop the recording, um, okay. and then you can still, if there are questions left, you can still answer them. Um.